Now on one, the indefatigable Patrick Moore sets his sights on Europe's exploration into space. Sorry, it's a little later than planned, but here it is. The sky at night. Nordweit in Holland at ESTEC, the technical center of the European Space Agency. ESTEC stands for European Space Research and Technology Center. It's in a new building set among the famous bulb fields of Holland, not far from Amsterdam, and is far from being an administrative center only. Many new spacecraft are designed and built here. We've become used to thinking of space research as being purely Russian or American, apart from occasional follies, such as the Giotto mission for Halley's Comet and the Japanese moon probes. But that's no longer true. Europe has well and truly entered the field. For example, between October the 5th and 23rd is what we call the launch window for an important new probe, Ulysses, which will be the first spacecraft to explore the poles of the sun. The European Space Agency really is international. It consists of 13 nations, of which I'm glad to say Britain is one. And during the coming years, there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity in space. The Director of Science at ESA is Professor Roger Bonnet. ESA was first named ESRO, the European Space Research Organization. And this was an organization which was uh, set up by the same people uh, who set up the CERN, the, uh, uh, Center for uh, Nuclear Research in, in Europe. Uh, this uh, was a response to the uh, challenge of the Sputnik and of the creation of NASA. And at the outset, uh, ESRO was created as a purely Pacific enterprise. ESRO, uh, which became later ESA, um, was created to undertake at the European level uh, projects in space which uh, no individual nation could do by itself. What do you think has been the greatest achievement so far? I suppose we all think about Giotto. Four, three, two, one, stop. Ignition. Giotto was launched by an Ariane rocket. And this was the first, way, the first time the Europeans launched their, uh, one of their satellites with their own means at the European level. It was also the first uh, launch of Ariane for a scientific mission. And it was the first attempt of the Europeans to travel into interplanetary space. Giotto sent back information from Halley's Comet when it went within 500 kilometers of the nucleus on the night of March the 13th, 1986. Dr. Rudiger Reinhardt was project scientist at the time. What are your memories of that night? Well, everything went uh, fairly well according to plan. Uh, we had beautiful data when suddenly, just seven seconds before close to approach, the screens went blank. That was a major disappointment. Um, another thing that comes back to my mind is uh, the colorful images of the uh, near nucleus region, which were extremely difficult to interpret. And it was only at um, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning of that night that we saw the first relatively clear black and white images which uh, showed the outline of the nucleus fairly well. And uh, I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning I saw my first, uh, as we then called it, crater on the surface of the comet. And for me this was the ultimate proof that we had actually seen uh, the uh, comet nucleus. The size of the nucleus from one end to the other is about uh, 15 kilometers, the diameter 8 kilometers, and it has this odd shape. It is fairly dark, and it has some very interesting uh, surface features, valleys, mountains, and so on. And to obtain these clear images of the nucleus, I would say, is perhaps the main achievement of the Giotto mission. Well, certainly it did achieve a great deal, but uh, more than four years have passed since then. What's the state of the spacecraft now? Uh, during the Halley flyby, the Giotto spacecraft was damaged by uh, dust particles impacting on the spacecraft at a very high velocity, 70 kilometers per second. You remember that the spacecraft is flying towards the uh, comet in that direction, 
And that means that all the dust particles impact on the leading face of, of the spacecraft. All the nice white paint on the underside has now uh, completely disappeared. That upsets the thermal subsystem of the spacecraft quite a bit. We know from post-encounter analysis that the baffle of the camera is completely gone, eroded away by dust particles. We know that the baffle of the star mapper is uh, damaged. Uh, the spacecraft is no longer uh, properly uh, balanced. It's like a, an uh, ill-balanced uh, tire on a car, you know. But all in all, you'd say the Giotto was a real success. I would certainly say it was a success as manifested by the thousands of scientific papers uh, that have been written. And uh, before the encounter, uh, some predicted that uh, the uh, comet science books would have to be rewritten after the encounter. And that, uh, I thought at the time, was perhaps uh, too ambitious, but it indeed happened. But we haven't heard the last of Giotto, I'm glad to say. It is still under control and is going to be sent on to another comet, Greg Schellerup. David, which experiments on Giotto are still functioning? Well, sadly, the camera, which uh, did such a beautiful job at uh, Halley, is not working uh, due to something being in the optical path. However, the rest of the instrumentation is uh, either totally working or partially working, which means that we'll be able to do a good job uh, at uh, Greg Scheller up for studying the chemistry and the plasma of the comet. How is this Giotto extended mission going to be financed? Well, unfortunately, at this time, we're suffering from a deficit, a projected deficit in the budget for 92 and 93. And this has come about because over the last uh, few years, we have suffered from delays, mainly caused by the Challenger accident and delays in the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, consequently, uh, we find that uh, in our normal ongoing budget, we would not have enough to finance even this small amount of $10 million for Giotto. So consequently, we are approaching the member states to fund a Giotto mission to Greg Scheller up through an optional program, where each member state can volunteer an amount of funds according to uh, whatever it might wish. When will we get the information back from Greg Scheller up? We're planning to reactivate Giotto, uh, because it's now in hibernation again, uh, in May of 1992. We will then do a series of pre-encounter tests, both on the spacecraft and again on the payload, to make sure that everything is functioning as it was when it hibernated, uh, prior to an encounter with Greg Scholar up on the 10th of July. And we should have the results uh, soon after that. But despite the most exhaustive tests, things can still go wrong. Consider Hipparchos, the astrometric satellite designed to obtain the most accurate star positions ever measured. Unfortunately, during the very final stages of the launch, there was a malfunction and Hipparchos went into the wrong orbit. Dr. Michael Penniman is project scientist. What actually went wrong and has it badly affected the satellite? The satellite is launched on uh, the top of the Ariane rocket and is put into a geostationary transfer orbit. This is a highly elliptical orbit uh, with the perigee, the point of closest approach to the Earth, um, about 500 kilometers above the Earth. What happens at the apogee of this orbit is that this apogee boost motor, which is roughly half the, satellite, uh, half the satellite's mass, was intended to boost the satellite from this elliptical orbit into a circular orbit which should have maintained the satellite at a constant position above the Earth. And this would have given us uh, a single unique contact between the Earth ground station and the satellite itself. Now what happened is this particular motor didn't fire. Uh, this is now well known. And so the satellite remained in this highly elliptical orbit. Could you take us through the rest of the model? Yes. The payload itself, the main part of the instrumentation, is enclosed within this shade structure. We can't see too much from this model, but the main features are one field of view uh, here and another field of view just here. And this is really uh, a telescope. The special feature being these two entrance apertures, two fields of view, and the light from the sky uh, is brought together to a common focal surface and as the satellite spins around an axis the star images cross a modulating grid and from the 
signals uh, of the stars, we can recover the relative positions, the relative separations of the uh, stars in the sky. The mission's aims were to measure the uh, positions, the proper motions, and the parallaxes of a large number of stars. Uh, in the program, we have something like 120,000 stars, and the prediction or the promise was to measure these with something like two milliarc seconds accuracy on the positions and the parallaxes, and about two milliarc seconds per year on the proper motions. And these are accuracies that are extremely difficult to achieve from the ground, principally because of the effects of the atmosphere, which degrades these kinds of positional estimates. And Hipparchos would do this more accurately than ever before. Absolutely, yes. Uh, compared with what we can achieve on the ground, uh, an improvement of at least a factor of 10, uh, perhaps a factor of 100. Well, Hipparchos is working. What do you expect now? Well, fortunately, we expect a lot more than we did immediately after the failure. Uh, the expectations of the lifetime were rather pessimistic. We had the expectation that the satellite would survive only six months or so. Uh, fortunately, these estimates of the lifetime have been revised strongly upwards, and we now have an expectation of about a three or four year lifetime. Uh, this means, fortunately, that we can really recover all of the science, essentially all of the science that we intended to do. Part of the Hubble Space Telescope was made at ESTEC, uh, not, I hasten to add, the main mirror, which was incorrectly figured, but one of the most important instruments, the faint object camera. Robin Lawrence is the project manager. Robin, just how badly will the fault in the main mirror affect your faint object camera? Well, this uh, problem has two effects on the uh, operation of the faint object camera. One is that not all of the light is concentrated in the central part of the image of a star. So this reduces the sensitivity of the instrument. And this uh, light, which is not there, scatters around it, which can obscure fainter objects that you're trying to look at. All the same, you can do some excellent science with it. Yes, we've been making some observations just to see how the science is affected. And we have some startling results. Here we have uh, an observation of the supernova in the large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, this is the 1987 supernova. And you can see here a ring of a gas uh, which is glowing. And this ring of gas was blown off from the star when it was a supergiant. And it has been excited by the uh, supernova itself. Now, this ring had been just hinted at by ground-based observations. But here you can clearly see its shape and structure. And I'm sure the scientists will learn a lot from this observation. We've also been making some observation of 30 Dora, which is a globular cluster. And the idea here is to try and establish if there is one massive star within this cluster or if it's a series of individual stars. From the ground-based uh, observations, you can only see a concentration which you cannot resolve. And with this faint object camera image, first of all here we have one which is a raw image before processing and you can clearly see some individual stars. And then we can do image processing and resolve these individual stars. And this preliminary results indicate that there are many smaller stars in this central region, which is very interesting for the astronomers. At present, things are not perfect. Can any modifications be made? Yes, we're looking at how to modify the faint object camera to accommodate the spherical aberration in the telescope. We're even examining if it's possible for the astronauts to go up and open up the FOC and modify it in orbit. Let's hope that nothing goes wrong with the next major launch, that of Ulysses, the solar probe. And this is the actual spacecraft. And in a very short time from now, that will be on its way to the sun via Jupiter. It's now being prepared for flight in the clean room, which is why I'm dressed like this. The purpose of Ulysses is to examine the poles of the sun, which we can't see properly from here. We see the sun broadside on, so to speak. And to survey the poles, Ulysses has got to go right out of the ecliptic in a way that's never been done before. Of course, there have been solar probes. I mean, for example, in the 1970s, the German Helios II went within 45 million kilometers of the solar surface. But it was traveling more or less in the ecliptic, and therefore it couldn't survey the poles. The poles of the sun are as hot as anywhere else on the disk. Temperature not far short of 6,000 degrees centigrade. But the structure of the surface is rather different there, and it's important to find out just what it's like. 
Also, the sun is now near the peak of its cycle of activity, and so this is a very good time to launch Ulysses. But it's not going to be sent up from the usual rocket launching ground at Kourou in French Guiana. It's going to be launched by the Space Shuttle. I don't think it's always realized the um, tremendous amount of power that is needed to get into an ejection over the sun's poles. We want, for a direct injection, one would be talking about something like the amount of energy that was required for the Apollo moonshots. And therefore, by taking it up in the shuttle first and then using a very powerful rocket from there, we save a lot of the energy that would be needed. Even then, it is not enough to make a direct injection. How did you plan to get Ulysses so far out of the ecliptic? Well, because we don't have enough energy to make a direct injection, what we do is we make use of the gravitational force of Jupiter. So although we're going to the sun, we start off by going almost directly away from the sun, and then we get to Ju when we get to Jupiter, we make a swing by Jupiter to very precisely control distance and speed so that the force of Jupiter acts like a slingshot and whizzes us around and out of the ecliptic plane. Well, Derek, I wonder whether you've now taken us through the main components and instruments of Ulysses. The most obvious thing that you can see is, in fact, the large dish antenna, which is pointing upwards there, uh, with the letter E, which is inverted at the moment on it. This is a parabolic feed working at S-band and X-band, that is at frequencies of 2 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz approximately, and that is our main link of communication with the Earth. Below this, you can see four uh, boxes uh, which have got little red covers on. These are known as sun sensors, and those are used to orient the spacecraft. The red covers come off before launch to remind us that those are what we call red tag items, which cannot fly with the instrument. You can also see on the right-hand and left-hand side of the spacecraft two clusters of thrusters, which are used to orient the spacecraft. The spacecraft as a whole, you can see, is a rather gold color, and this gold color is a thermal blanket. It is not a simple device, it is in fact a multi-layer device. We have this outer layer of Kapton, and then a number of inside layers of very fine material, mylar, and each of these has to be perforated with a very special pattern. If this wasn't the case, when we went into space, the air trapped between the various layers would cause it to blow up like a balloon. The instruments are grouped in a bay, which is at the top of the spacecraft as we look at it now, and they have a number of instruments there which are measuring such things as solar wind, solar coronasphere, and things like this. At the very top, there is a silver-colored boom, and that boom, after injection into orbit, is deployed and the magnetometers on the end of that are then as far away from interference effects as possible. Before going over the sun's poles, Ulysses will pass by Jupiter. Well, I'm very interested in Jupiter as a planetary observer and presumably you'll get back information from there too. Yes, we are going to get results from most of the instruments during the Jupiter flyby. Unfortunately, our spacecraft, unlike a lot of the JPL spacecraft, does not have any visual cameras on board so we're not going to see the fantastic shots that we saw from Jupiter and Curve, Venus, etc., on the uh, Grand Tour. But uh, the instruments will be taking data, and it is very important because it serves to some extent as a precursor of Galileo, which will arrive at Jupiter about a year and a half after us. The main purpose of Ulysses is to study the sun's poles. Why are they so important? That is a very good question. Um, as with the Earth, you have the polar regions and the equator, equatorial regions. Um, at the moment, every, every probe that has been launched, every spacecraft that has been launched, has been almost entirely in the ecliptic plane, and therefore we only get to look at the sun sideways on. This has been likened by one of the experimenters that's flying on this to trying to understand the physics of the Earth by flying an aeroplane round and round the equator. The, the poles, just as for the Earth, where we only really understood how the northern lights occurred was when we started flying spacecraft over the poles and understood how the uh, magnetic field of the Earth worked in exactly the same way we need to fly over the poles of the Sun to understand how the Sun works. When will Ulysses pass over the poles? We start our science measurements as from the word go, of course but it takes us approximately 16 months to get out to Jupiter, 
and then about another year and a half before we reach the first pole of the Sun we go first over the south pole of the Sun and later cross through the ecliptic plane and go over the north pole of the Sun the polar passage on the south pole is about four years after launch and the one that finishes on the north pole about five years after launch it's amazing to think that you and I are standing within a few feet of a probe that's actually going to be launched it's going to go over the Sun in the near future and I imagine you're pretty excited about it oh yes of course one's always excited and scared too because space is a risky business you never know for sure whether it's going to work there is nothing guaranteed in the space business so it's a very exciting and very scary time for all of us so Ulysses will soon be on its way but there are going to be other solar probes as well it, it should uh, be seen as a coherent program in a sense that uh, we are looking at an, uh, how to understand the main source of energy of the solar system, which is essentially the sun. Now, uh, the sun is a very complex machine. It feeds us with energy. Uh, it affects the weather on all planets, including ours. And we would like to understand the first degree of interaction between the solar events and uh, the uh, Earth environment. And to do that, uh, we need uh, to uh, have a spacecraft which looks continuously at the sun in order to monitor all the little uh, uh, events, or the big events, which affect our uh, star. And we also want to monitor uh, the reaction of the Earth environment. So we have a, a couple of spacecraft of, of missions, SOHO, uh, the Sol Solar uh, Heliospheric Observatory, which will look at the sun in a continuous way. This spacecraft will be placed at the Lagrangian point uh, between the sun and the Earth, that is to say this point where uh, the gravity attraction of the sun is equal to the gravity attraction of the, sun, of the Earth and the moon together. Uh, so the spacecraft is in continuous view of the sun and looks at it uh, permanently. Uh, on the other side, uh, looking at the Earth, orbiting nearby the Earth, is a set of four satellites, uh, smaller satellites, called clusters. They form a cluster of satellites flying in a pyramidal uh, uh, configuration, and they will study the interaction between the solar uh, flux, the solar particles, and the magnetosphere of the Earth. There are other satellites, too. Well, uh, ESA has set up a long-term program and has uh, several missions in preparation. One of the next major mission is the uh, so-called Infrared Solar uh, Space Observatory, ISO. And ISO is a mission which is unique in the history of astronomy in the sense that uh, it's a major observatory for the uh, study of the infrared uh, light of our universe. ISO will be launched in 1993 if everything goes well, and today everything seems to go well, uh, by an Ariane 4 uh, launcher, and will be put placed into a very uh, eccentric orbit, which uh, allows uh, the spacecraft to look for a very long time at the same object and study it in detail. Uh, this mission uh, is certainly unique in the overall context of the worldwide effort in space astronomy. Certainly we've come a long way since the European Space Agency was founded. There have been many triumphs, remember Giotto, and the outlook is exciting. Ulysses is ready to go. Then there are others, such as the Cassini mission to Saturn that I mentioned in the sky at night a couple of months ago. The European contribution there is the Huygens probe, scheduled to make a controlled landing on the surface of Saturn's fascinating moon, Titan. And um, as you can see from the spacecraft models here, Europe is right in the forefront of space research today. And so, from the European Space Agency Technical Headquarters at Nordwijk in Holland, good night.